Hello guys, welcome to this class. This is the first of the series where I'm going to take you through the whole process of creating the sculpture of um, Italian DJ Claudio Coccoluto. Um, at the time I'm speaking, unfortunately, he passed away a few weeks ago. Um, and therefore I decided to tribute him creating this one six scale model um, the image that I've chose is the one that you can see uh, on the top corner of the, um, the sheet that you see next to me next to my workspace um, where he's holding a record what you can see here is um, basically my preparation my prepping for every sculpture um, where I represent a human being uh, it's basically what you what it might look like a ball made of clay, but it's got actually it's got a soul as a center made out of um, tin foil, very compressed and shaped to be the core. Um, I stick um, sometimes it can be um, a long skewer, and sometimes as you can see on this image, um, I put in a a painting brush that I don't normally use for painting um, so that I can hold it in maybe not right at this time but in later on when things are gonna start taking shape I'm actually gonna use that to hold the um, um, the head as you can see I start taking measurements from the pictures the pictures are um, pictures that I found online I when I choose a subject I go scouring the internet to find best pictures I can, showing the front, the side, um, and every possible corner of the subject. Um, and then, uh, with this, with the printing software, uh, I put it next to a scale model of the human figure. And, and with that, I pretty much get consistent dimensions in all the pictures um, that are matching the scale of the the um, subject, the, the the scale that I chose for the specific subject, which in this case, as I said before, is scale one to six. So what I begin doing is uh, getting roughly all the sizes of the head from the top, like basically the overall sides of the oval, and then I move on to taking various positionings in the middle for all the facial features. As you can see here, I'm measuring where the mouth, and when I say the mouth, I mean the actual cut of the mouth, not where the lips, either the bottom or the top lips begin, but literally where the cut of the mouth is. And then I proceed to draw these measures um, onto the ball, which is later going to be a head. Uh, but as you know, as of now, is pretty much just a ball, and then I'm measuring, as you can see now, where the nose start start uh, from a perspective from the bottom of the chin to the point where the the nose basically appears. Uh, as you can see, I'm using um, um, a tool that is called the caliber. Uh, it's it makes it very easy to do this job. If I was to use uh, just you know a tape measure I would have to literally take down all the measures and then and then remember them and report them onto the this thing you position it it stays and it actually helps you because when you when you touch the clay it will leave a mark because it's quite sharp and uh, and allow me to have all this these little markings where I want them, and they are always going to be precise. I'm now taking the measurements as to the point where the middle of the eyes is, which is also the point of the bridge um, of the nose, where the nose creates a bridge and then goes onto the forehead. Um, so that's that's the point where exactly what I, what I put down uh, in, in that specific moment was exactly the line of the center of the eyes.
as I do all these processes, I'm also in the same time whilst I take measures as I can start seeing the various um, spaces that the features are going to take on the face, I begin to shape this ball, imagining a human skeleton underneath. Um, well, you, you need to have a bit of understanding of anatomy when you first do this kind of projects. Um, it will take you some time and it will help you to have um, an anatomy book with you uh, so that you can see in, in this case you could just look at what the um, what the skeleton looks like underneath the skull specifically in the case of the head um, what, what I'm doing now is um, taking um, the distance between the eyes which is gonna allow me to um, hollow out the space um, where the eye bulbs are gonna go in uh, I think they call the orbits anyway yeah I'm hollowing out the area that I'm is gonna is gonna be occupied by the eyeballs the eyeballs I prepare um, before I even start the sculpture I try to um, as realistically as possible get information about the eye color of the subject and and then I have a whole procedure to create realistic eyes uh, where um, well, most the, the mo most of the body, the actual bulb is created with um, with polymer clay, like everything else. Um, but then I use a resin over the iris, which is painted on. The while well, the iris is painted on, and then with a um, UV resin, I create um, a little see-through hard dome, which. Uh, which is also very light reflective and gives the eyes a very strong sense of real. Um, I'll probably yeah you can actually see the eyes there on the, um, on the they framed at the moment they're ready there to be to be placed in the in the socket. Um, probably at some point uh, create a video specifically for eye creation. It's not too difficult depending on the sides it just takes a bit of time and getting used to it just takes practice like everything really so creating the eye sockets actually gives me a very clear idea of how the skull is gonna start shaping and in fact starting from this from these from the eye sockets I begin shaping up the, um, the whole of the head again imagining that there is a skeleton underneath um, right now well you know as you can see the eyes have been positioned and uh, what I'm doing now is pushing from various directions because I want to first of all make sure that the eyes are on the same level and second I, n I need to make sure also that they are at the same depth otherwise something is going to look fundamentally wrong in the in the sculpture as you can see I, I i work around the clay to make sure that i create the right space for the eyes to fit in It's really not going around having a good um, a good sense of by looking at things, understanding whether they are on the right level, whether they are um, correctly placed. Uh, there's literally no tools. As you can see there, I, I took the measurements in between the, the two pupils from the picture to make sure that the eyes have correct distance between between each other otherwise um, you can't really get the, um, the likeness of the subject if the eyes are not correct that's something that really is gonna 
it's going to ruin it for you. You will not be able to achieve likeness with the subject you're trying to represent. So I can't stress that enough. Um, you need to make sure that you have good reference pictures and that you can you can take correct measurements to ensure that some there are some things that you really can't can't get around. Um, as you can see in this case, because in the picture that I've chosen is looking sort of like sideways, um, I'm actually having to reposition the eyes so that the pupils and the irises are directed onto the side, which is normally not how I do my portraits. I normally choose pictures where the subject is actually looking straight forward, straight on. Um, in fact, I think that in this specific case, I had created the eyes um, as if they were going to be used on, a, on an image that would look f straight on, dead on. Um, so I had to actually, when I realized what I was going to do, I had to cut some part of the back of the, um, the eyeball um, and reshape it to make sure that um, when I turn it in the head, it's not going to just look awkward or, or um, incorrectly positioned. And here I take a little bit of time looking at it from many angles, trying to understand if when the eyelids are going to be on, it's going to, uh, I'm, I'm going to have a correct positioning um, of the of the pupils and the, the irises. And as I do that, I'm also beginning to fill up spaces um, because gaps have been created at the moment around the eyeballs and when when the eyelids are going to go on you don't want these gaps to be too deep because otherwise the eyelids are going to just sink in and uh, at the same time it is not advisable to leave uh, air pockets in the clay before you bake it because the air pockets are going to just they're just going to want to come out, out to the surface whilst the, the clay is baking and that can create wreckage on the, on the surface. Sometimes if they can't make it out, they just, you, the, these air pockets remain slightly underneath the surface and you can see this discoloration or like a oddly colored effect. Um, and then if you apply pressure, you might actually even break it in some points. So yeah, always try and make sure to um, really knead the, um, um, the clay and work it quite a bit before you start using it so that you, you sort of like uh, um, eliminate the possibility of having air pockets in the, in the, you know, within the texture. And... As you can see now, I'm beginning to create the eyelids. The way I do the eyelids is basically I flatten the clay very, very, very flat, as you would imagine for eyelids, is a flap of skin very, very, very um, thin. And then proceed to place it from one end to the other of the eye, uh, covering the the whole surface of the eyeball um, and bridging the two ends of the eye socket. Um, then I try to stick it properly onto the skin of the head of the you know, uh, around the, um, the eye sockets before I proceed to actually shape uh, the cut of the eye. Um, so it's going to be just like a, sort of like a line going across the iris and the pupil and then I start creating the curve that I see from the reference from the image um, I sometimes like to keep my big screen on my computer at the back of my workstation um, on with the images reference images uh, much bigger than the ones I have for the measurements 
uh, right next to me because uh, uh, sometimes you actually need you need a bigger image to get properly the sense of the curve of the of the eyes of the eyelids um, and so yes once I position it and I'm sure that is uh, where I want it to be I begin shaping it and try to copy what I see on my reference image the image that I've uh, chose to um, set into this portrait takes a little bit of getting used to um, uh, then make sure that um, all the clay smooths and evens up with the rest of the clay around it uh, it's just a little bit fiddly you have to work without ruining um, the positioning and the lines that you're trying to represent and create I bet you get there it's a um, it's a patience kind of work and I usually start with the bottom eyelid because when you look at eyes uh, human eyes then normally um, it looks as if the top eyelid sort of like um, on the corners covers a little bit the bottom eyelid and it's uh, it's easier to achieve that kind of look when you obviously position the bottom eyelid first and the top eyelid second there goes the top eyelid As I said before, on this scale, things are a little bit fiddly. Things are really small, as you can see. Um, sometimes it takes a few trials before things get in the right position, as you wish them to be. You just have to be patient and keep trying. Another thing is if, if you can see here the right eye already has both eyelids um, I kind of start sketching up the shape um, obviously trying to get as close as possible to what the, um, the final result that I'm looking for is but I'm not I'm not taking a hell of a lot of time trying to achieve perfection at this stage what I want is to outline um, and sketch the right proportions the right shapes or at least the shapes that are very close to be uh, to have the appearance of being right um, I go back over everything anyway later on you know when things start coming together more um, I can actually have a, a more precise and more complete overall look of the portrait uh, which which helps finding imperfections and it takes training your eye a lot to look for things to look for um, when something doesn't look quite right um, understanding where do you have to work and what you have to change at this scale such a small uh, little face uh, it's not an easy thing you have to really train your eye um, right, as you can see in this case once I position the eyelid um, I'm actually using my knife tool to remove some excess clay in the area that I want to shape and some people might just push with the tool push away from the center of the eye and from and away from the um, part that is covering the pupil and it, it might be 
too much so that it needs to be uncovered and pushed up. But I find that this sort of like uh, um, creates a situation where I um, I find too much clay a must above the eye where the eyelid should be and the eyelid needs to remain um, very thin. It's a very thin flap of, of skin as, it was, as we were saying before. Um, so sometimes I just use the knife as if it was um, a pencil and draw the line of the eye um, on this flap that is the, um, the eyelid uh, so as to shape it the way I want it and that way I remove the clay instead of pushing it up and away from the center and then as you can see here I'm also removing the excess clay uh, from where uh, the flap of skin joins the forehead because that's another thing we don't want to we don't want to get. Um, and here I created a shape um, that is like a little sausage to start sketching up the nose. We will go from the, the nose bridge that we've identified at the beginning uh, to the line that is set in the middle of the face, which I um, measured from the chin to where the tip of the nose is. Once I position this, um, let's call it this little sausage made out of clay, um, I start working on its sides. And first, with various tools, I, I basically smooth it in into the face. And when that's achieved, I'm actually going to start working um, on the shapes. And the shapes come from, from various measures. Uh, first, I'm going to check uh, how, uh, how wide it is. I'm going to check how much it uh, sticks out from the face by comparing it to the picture I have of the profile. And so, uh, as you can see here, I'm going to remove some clay because it sticks out a bit too much. And then I'm trying to pay attention whether it's too wide, um, so to speak, too thick. And I'm going to start working on the sides. So as to reduce it, I find it that many people um, make this mistake on such small sculptures, um, and I used to do it as well. Sometimes we tend to make noses a little bit too big, too wide, especially. Um, it's it's not very easy to find the right balance on the nose in such a small scale. Uh, so I encourage you to take some time and put a lot of attention when you make noses. Uh, one thing I can tell you, once it clicks with you, once you uh, you get what a nose should look like on such a small scale, it becomes, it becomes a lot easier. Then every subsequent time that you are creating a portrait, uh, it will be a lot easier. Because um, having spent a bit of time finding the right proportions it really puts you in the right in the right direction and then eventually makes it so easy to just repeat the same result um, unless of course you find the subject with a very big or wide nose which is a completely different matter but you will know what to look for and you will know how to reproduce and replicate the nose that you're looking for
I really take my time trying to find the correct shape and sides of the nose. And the nostrils will only come on later. And only when I feel that the nose the nose's shape is, is getting there, is pretty much there. Oh, there's always room for um, little corrections, but once I set it, once I feel that it's there, um, the next step now, as you can see now, that's what's going to be is I'm going to add um, a piece of clay um, to create a volume underneath the nose where the top lip is going to be. That volume will basically bridge between uh, the end of the nose at the bottom and the and the cut of the lips where where the mouth opens basically the opening of the mouth I'm not going to shape the lip yet um, but I'm creating this volume because it's very important you don't want basically uh, the nose and the nostrils to be sort of separated from from the face as if it's something that is stuck up uh, at the bottom the nose um, it's um, it's kind of like a, a, especially the part of the nostrils it's kind of like inside the the, um, the face is a, a sort of set back and the volume of the lips sort of like creates this um, um, this effect, this visual effect between the bottom of the lips and the cheeks. I take some time here to um, make sure that all the parts are um, blended in together correctly and to make sure that the volumes begin looking the way they should be looking. You'll see me using the pliers uh, from time to time. Um, what I do is uh, basically whenever I spot little um, little dirt and and maybe some some hair even fabrics bits of fabric from clothes uh, i try to keep the clay as clean as possible even whilst i'm working on it the clay is literally it's a dirt magnet as you as you will find out if you don't look after it it'll it'll get very dirty and then it's going to that's going to show when you paint it it really tends to make your life really difficult so it's better to keep it in check. Although, as you will find out later, there are ways to, um, upon finishing up the and polishing the um, the final result, uh, and before baking, uh, you can sort of like have ways of cleaning it. Uh, there are oils and there are especially acetone. I find that works very well. It smooths the um, clay and it also cleans it from the most visible uh, bits and pieces that have got stuck to it. But the things that get a little bit deeper, uh, you have to remove them with a tool if you don't want them to show. Um, I've added the bottom lip there, as you can see. Well, I've added the, vol the volume for the bottom lip. Um, I'm starting to constru construct all the features and I'm looking at both the front side, the front view and the side view because it's very important um, to work together. The volumes must be correct from, from all the sides, from all the angles that you look at it. And as I keep adding volumes and I... I see areas that, because of all the changes that I'm that I'm I'm creating around, I see areas that have become suddenly more recessed or more or too protruding. Um, I try to work on 
the overall vol volumetry of the face holistically as one thing. So even though I'm taking care of the lips, all of a sudden I might just move on to fix something on the forehead. Um, right now, what I'm going to do is add the volume for them, um, for the point of the forehead above the eyes. Which, once the eyes have gone on, um, needs to stick out more because volumetrically speaking it's uh, it's on the forefront it comes before the, the eyes are set behind it so what I do I is just I simply add clay and then begin to shape it around once I got volume on top I use my tools to um, to make it look as I wish it to look. And then I go on blending in the new clay that I added. That's also something that I tend to do right on the spot. I don't like having all the lines of the um, clay that's been added. Some people work more um, in a rough way, whereby they keep everything rough whilst they whilst they working on it, and then when they feel that it's complete, they start smoothing it out. Um, I don't. I kind of like as I work. I've always. I, I'm. I'm always trying to keep a sort of like finished look, even though I know very well it's far from the finished, but. I try to keep keep it as smooth as possible, even considering the fact that I'm I'm st still gonna work a lot on each part. Um, in this case, after I added the um, um, the protruding part above the eyes, I find that the forehead has been pushed to the back too much, and I therefore add volume on that area as well to bring it forward. And I continue doing this until I eventually match, at least I match it to my eyes, um, what the look of the front and the side view of the subject is. And I continue smoothing things out, as you can see, blurring those lines, making them disappear, and, and blending everything in. Uh, and as I do it, I keep looking at the whole, at the overall, at the overall um, look of the portrait, and continue touching parts that feel that maybe need more blending like for instance in this case the nose with the side of the face and I think that will do it that will be enough for the this first class um, there'll be, uh, I think, two more classes for the face. Uh, we have a rough sketch. Uh, things start to get in place. Of course, there's a lot more work to do. But from here on, things are going to start to unravel at a much faster pace. So um, I'll wait for you on the next class, guys. Don't miss it. Bye.